Hello and welcome to Distillations, extracts from the past, present, and future of chemistry. I'm Mayor Rindy. This is our 100th episode. And to celebrate this milestone, we're bringing you updates on some of our favorite stories from the past few years. We'll hear reports from California, Michigan, and Washington, D.C. That's coming up on today's landmark episode of Distillations. It's true, we're celebrating a milestone birthday here at Distillations, 100 episodes. But before we get to the festivities, we have a bit of business to take care of. First, we have a new URL, chemheritage.org slash distillations. Come on over to see the new site, listen to past shows, and tell us what you think about this one. Second, we'd like to congratulate Victoria Indeviro, our new executive producer. She's been with us since the beginning, but now she's running the show. Rest assured, we're in good hands. Now on to business. Because we talk a lot about history on our show, we don't often need to give an update. History, for the most part, tends to remain safely in the past. But we've covered plenty of current topics in our two-plus years, so in honor of our 100th episode, we're following up on three past stories. First, back in October of 2008, that was episode 46, Reporter Devin Brown brought us a story from Warren, Michigan, about GM's lithium-ion battery-powered vehicles. Devin, welcome back. Hi, Mayor. So, what's been going on at GM since then? Well, in 2008, the folks at GM's battery lab were still testing the lithium-ion batteries to see how they would hold up over time. They passed the test, and despite the fact that the government took over the company in 2009, GM's Chevy Volt will still hit the market this fall. Toyota, Ford, and Fisker Automotive, which is a a startup, will also introduce plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, or PHEVs, in the next few months. Just to give you a bit of background, plug-in hybrids do have a combustion engine, but unlike the Prius and other current hybrids, the engine doesn't run the car. Instead, it acts as a sort of charger for the lithium-ion battery. And motor companies feel this interim step is needed to alleviate range anxiety, which is basically how far an electric car can travel before it needs a charge. The Chevy Volt should get about 40 miles per charge, while the Prius PHEV will only get about 12 miles. The new Prius uses a much smaller battery to keep costs down, but with the addition of the gasoline engine charger, both cars have an estimated range of about 300 miles before needing a charge. Here's the problem. It can take anywhere from 3 to 12 hours to charge up the battery, depending on the current. And charging stations are few and far between. So for now, GM is targeting drivers that won't exceed 40 miles in a single day. You know, people that are commuting to work and running errands. The marketing focus is on people who have a second car they can use to travel longer distances. Still, there are plans to install thousands of charging stations around the country in the next several years, and some of these even offer a full battery swap to get around the long charging times. Full electrics aren't far behind plug-in hybrids. GM announced plans to come out with an all-electric Volt in the next few years, and the Nissan Leaf is expected to hit the road in December. Devin, thanks so much for the update. No problem. My pleasure. Our next update comes from the San Francisco Bay Area. In our second episode of Distillations back in December of 2007, reporter Catherine Girardot covered an unconventional oil spill cleanup effort in the Bay. In November of that year, a container ship rammed the San Francisco Bay Bridge, spilling 58,000 gallons of fuel oil into the water. Scientists and volunteers rushed to soak up oil on the beaches using mats made of hair. Catherine is back to tell us how things turned out. Volunteers were actually quite successful cleaning up Bay Area beaches. But the big question remained, how to dispose of the oil-soaked hair mats? They didn't want to burn them, as that would create more pollution. What I've done was take uh, nine 55-gallon drums of oil, hair, and mushrooms and composted those using this process. Thomas Aswell is a researcher at UC Berkeley's College of Natural Resources. He headed up the bioremediation project. The idea was to mix the mushrooms with the oil so they could eat it 
and render it non-toxic. But it didn't work. Something went wrong. The oil itself is actually too toxic for the fungi. Within a couple months, uh, all the oyster mushrooms had died. The oil basically poisoned them. Oil is made up of hydrocarbons, molecules of hydrogen and carbon. Some hydrocarbons, which make up the lighter parts of crude oil, are carcinogenic. The heavier parts of crude oil, with more molecular weight, are toxic because they stick to fish and mammals and prevent them from flying or feeding. And if these heavier hydrocarbons spill into water, they deplete the water's oxygen levels, poisoning the environment for underwater life. Aswell's advisor, UC Berkeley microbiologist John Coates, says the mushrooms in Aswell's compost mixture didn't stand a chance. These sort of organic mushrooms are not necessarily adapted to living in environments that are highly contaminated with hydrocarbons. Very few organisms are. Though one type of organism, a microscopic one, loves hydrocarbons, in fact, thrives on them. Enter microorganisms. Now, as these hydrocarbons are exposed to oxygen, uh, microorganisms have evolved the ability to insert that oxygen into the molecular structure, destabilize the molecular structure, and in that way, break the molecule down. Turning the hydrocarbons into plain old carbon. No more messy oil. In recent months, experts have been scrambling to manage a much bigger spill than the one in the Bay. You all know this story. BP the Deepwater Horizon, and a massive plume of oil spewing into the Gulf of Mexico. Thomas Aswell gets to work on a revised compost project. At his test lab in Port Sonoma, 37 miles north of San Francisco, he brews a rich mix of hydrocarbon-hungry microbes, the first step in a three-step process. First, he trains his microbes to eat the oil. And if you want them to greeting Louisiana sweet crude, you need to feed them a little bit of Louisiana sweet crude. So you want to give them just enough so they get a taste of it. That will be what they look for when you actually put them onto the oil. Next, he adds the microbes to the compost mixture, where they start breaking down the hydrocarbons. And then the new secret ingredient, worms. Lots and lots of worms. Probably about 30,000 pounds of worms. Aswell's advisor, John Coates, says adding the worms does two things. One is it helps mix the whole system and keep everything homogeneous. They also uh, provide aeration pockets to allow oxygen down to help the microbial community that biodegrade the oils. I let the worms eat all of the compost. I make sure they process all of it so they're going to further degrade the hydrocarbons. They're going to uh, sequester any heavy metals that are left in it. And what you get as an end product is what they call castings. Worm poop. Non-toxic and good fertilizer for agriculture. But will it work? I mean, we're talking millions of gallons of oil leaked into the Gulf. John Coates is realistic. At a medium scale, we're testing its potential for success. But at the sort of large scale right now, I don't believe it's ready as a technology to satisfy the needs of the spill that has occurred down the Gulf Coast. Partly because to do composting, you have to move all the oil from the water to land. Given how much oil has leaked into the Gulf, moving it all to land might not be practical. For these scientists, the crucial first step is to permanently close off the leaking oil at its source and then evaluate how best to move it, reclaim it, or render it harmless. For Distillations, I'm Catherine Girardot. Catherine Girardot is a digital storyteller with Earprint Productions in San Francisco. Special thanks to Stephen Short, who helped out on this story. If you'd like to hear Catherine's original report, visit our new website, chemheritage.org slash distillations. I'm Mayor Rindy. About 18 months ago, as then-president-elect Barack Obama was preparing to take office, we asked environmental history and policy expert Jody Roberts to write out a wish list for the new administration's environmental policies. Now, deep into Obama's second year in office, we check in with Jody to see how the administration is doing. It might be hard to believe, given the ecological disaster that continues to unfold in the Gulf, but there has actually been a lot of progress in environmental policy. 
In 2009, the EPA began a serious appraisal of the effects of mountaintop removal coal mining on local water systems. Hundreds of these operations throughout Appalachia never received proper impact assessments before mining began. It was a Herculean task, but EPA's review has brought new scrutiny to a monstrously destructive practice. The EPA has also crafted a new vision for chemical management, leading to, among other things, a chemicals of concern priority list, the first of its kind. Legislators have followed suit, drafting major chemical reform bills for the first time since the Toxic Substances Control Act was passed in 1976. The widely supported effort attempts to update an old statute with 35 years of new knowledge. Of course, the devil of reform is in the details, but the significance of this step can't be dismissed. And just this spring, the President's Cancer Panel delivered its annual report, calling for more attention to environmental exposure as a basis for disease. That's the good news. Unfortunately, there's been plenty of bad news. We've witnessed just how difficult it is to move politically on issues like climate change and energy and transportation infrastructures. The mine disasters in West Virginia and the growing concerns with natural gas drilling in the Marcellus Shale remind us that climate change isn't the only risk associated with fossil fuels. And, of course, the oil spreading across the Gulf of Mexico is a daily reminder of just how unsustainable our current system is. Eighteen months into the Obama presidency, and I realize my wish list has fallen short. Perhaps the problem is that wishing doesn't accomplish much. So this time I have a to-do list, or at least a work-towards list, in acknowledgement that shifting momentum is a process, one that doesn't happen overnight. So here are three things we should work towards. One, a comprehensive chemicals policy that encourages innovation towards more sustainable processes and products. Two, the creation of an energy infrastructure that prioritizes conservation and then produces what we actually need with small, decentralized, networked energy sources. And three, making sure that our society shift towards a more sustainable culture does not come through a shifting of our burdens to other more vulnerable populations here at home or across the globe. For Distillations, I'm Jody Roberts. Jody Roberts is Program Manager of Environmental History and Policy for CHF's Center for Contemporary History and Policy. If you'd like to add to Jody's work towards list, send your ideas to distillations at chemheritage.org or add a comment on our new website, chemheritage.org slash distillations. And that's it for our 100th episode. Distillations is a presentation of the Chemical Heritage Foundation. Our show is produced by Victoria Indeviro, Mia Lobel, Jennifer Dionisio, and Michal Meyer. Our theme music is composed and performed by Dave Kaufman. Additional music provided from Music Alley. Check it out at musicalley.com. Please tell us what you think about our program and send suggestions for future shows to distillations at chemheritage.org. Until next time, I'm Mayor Rindy. <laughs>